Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Institute for Government and this conversation on the future of the UK's defence with David Williams, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Defence and Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radican. Before we dive in to the many, many questions and aspects of this question, I'm going to uh, just do a few housekeeping arrangements. We're going to be live tweeting from IFG events using the hashtag IFG UK Defence. Please do follow and tweet along. Please send in your questions as early as you like. If you give your name or where you're viewing from, it's really helpful to us and helpful to me in sifting through the questions. And you can post your, your questions in the panel on the right of the screen. We're going to have a video and sound recording on our website within 24 hours, thanks to the great IFG team. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, Director of the Institute. Let me say what a great pleasure it is to have both of the two of you here today. It's, it's one of the things that makes this an almost unique discussion, I think perhaps uh, possibly unique. We um, have been following the words that each of you have put out on the uh, defence strategy and on the department itself, but to have you both here answering questions at this time is in, of enormously of interest. Admiral Sir Tony Radican, as I think you will all know, um, as Chief of the Defence Staff, is the professional head of the UK's armed forces and the principal military advisor to the Prime Minister and Secretary of State for Defence. Previously served as First Sea Lord and Chief of Naval Staff when he oversaw much transformation of the Navy and has served in many appointments, including three tours in Iraq. I was interested, you're also a qualified barrister. We, I suspect, are not going to be touching too much on that today, but you never know. David Williams was appointed Permanent Secretary at the MOD in April last year. Previously was Second Permanent Secretary at the Department for Health and Social Care from the outbreak of coronavirus, which is um, some experience. And he has previously been Director General of Finance at both the MOD and the Department of Health. Very, very glad that you're both with us. You're both going to speak. And um, then I've got some questions, and there are going to be many here and many online. They're coming in already. Thank you for that. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Bronwyn, uh, for that kind introduction. I'm conscious the last time I spoke in public, I thought I'd made a good impression until I read the papers the following morning, and I saw myself described as Britain's top general. Uh, hopefully, I'll do better today. <laughs> Um, it's a pleasure to be at the Institute for Government, and it's perhaps a different kind of venue for a defence speech, but one that reflects the importance that David and I attach to reforming the Ministry of Defence to better support our nation's interests. And it's great to be joined by the second Permanent Secretary, Lawrence Lee, who, with the Vice Chief Admiral Tim Fraser, make up what we call the Quad, and that reflects the close alignment between the military and civilian leadership at the top of the department. Now we'll hear from David in a moment, but just as a scene setter from me, we meet at an extraordinary time. Our thoughts and admiration are with the people of Ukraine in their heroic struggle for the future of their country. The scenes coming out of Mariupol and elsewhere are horrific and the coming weeks will continue to be very difficult, but in many ways, Putin has already lost. Far from being the far-sighted manipulator of events that he would have us believe, Putin has damaged himself through a series of catastrophic misjudgments. He has failed to recognize how deeply the notions of sovereignty, democracy, and national identity have taken root in Ukraine. Like all authoritarians, he allowed himself to be misled as to his own strength, including the effectiveness of the Russian armed forces. And lastly, he has failed to anticipate the unity and cohesion that exists among the free nations of the world, here in Europe and obviously far beyond. His actions to date have done more to galvanize than divide and have shown Ukraine to have the one thing that Russia conspicuously lacks, which is real friends. What is very clear is that Putin is a weaker and more diminished figure today than he was a month ago. 
And conversely, NATO is stronger and more united today than at any time I can remember. Buoyed by this renewed sense of unity and purpose, Western nations like our own need to be taking a long-term view as we calibrate our response. Because Putin's actions over many years represent a concerted challenge to the rules and values that safeguard security and prosperity worldwide. But these challenges are not restricted just to Europe. As the world watched Russian tanks roll into Ukraine, North Korea continued ballistic missile tests, 11 just in the first three months of this year. Iranian-backed Houthi rebels attacked Saudi oil facilities, and China has continued to claim vast swathes of international waters in the South China Sea, building and militarizing artificial islands as they go. The West's response to Russia is being closely watched in Tehran, Beijing, and Pyongyang. But it's also being watched by a host of other countries, including the economic and demographic powers of tomorrow, all of which are considering their approach to the international system. The security of the 2040s and 2050s is being shaped before us today. So one year on from the government's integrated review, my premise is threefold. First, the threat we face is much larger than the future of Ukraine, important though that is. We face a sustained attempt to challenge and undermine the international rules-based system here in Europe and elsewhere. Second, the British armed forces must be more active and engaged in the world, working with our partners in NATO and beyond to protect and advance the national interest and our shared democratic values. Third, this means defence has an even greater responsibility to deliver the integrated review, and we must work even harder to become an even more effective department. And that's why we're here today. This event is really the culmination of a conversation that has taken place between David, Tim, Lawrence and me over the past few months about how the department needs to change in order to respond to the threats and meet the ambitions set out in the government's integrated review. It's not about more people or more money. It's about picking up the pace, responding to the government's direction by showing even more ambition and focusing on delivery. Because sometimes it seems we're more focused on governance, assurance, and balancing the books. Those things matter, of course, but they should be taken as a given and certainly shouldn't come at the expense of our core role of looking after the nation's defense and security. With that, it's my pleasure to hand you over to David to talk through our priorities and some of the changes we have in mind. Uh, thank you. Tony, um, thanks very much for that uh, introduction. And Bronwyn, thank you uh, to you and the Institute for Government for uh, hosting us uh, here, uh, here today. Um, Tony's maiden speech at CDS uh, last December uh, was notable, uh, at least in my mind, uh, by uh, acknowledging the existence of the Permanent Secretary uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Ministry of Defence. Uh, and today we're going one further by, uh, by appearing as a, as a double act. Uh, uh, and in part, the reason why we're here together, uh, Bronwyn, as you were uh, just hinting at the beginning, uh, is the quite distinctive nature uh, of uh, defence. Uh, I've spent most of my civil service career in the department. I, I first worked in the MAD in, in 1990. Uh, and I generally think that uh, we are at our best uh, when uh, military and civilian voices uh, come together, uh, combining our different perspectives uh, and skills, uh, genuinely being more than the sum of our, uh, our parts, uh, not just in the MAD uh, head office, but actually uh, uh, across the Department of the Armed Forces, in the frontline commands, in our enabling organisations. Um, the MAD is, by its nature, a uh, large and uh, complex uh, organisation. Uh, but I think, given those circumstances, it's even more important uh, that, uh, from the top, the leadership team uh, tries to cut through some of that complexity, uh, some of the bureaucracy, to provide a really clear 
uh, articulation of priorities and uh, what we want to see uh, delivered. Uh, and as Tony says, um, uh, the four of us, the, uh, uh, the quad, it wouldn't be the MOD if you didn't put a, a, label, uh, a label on it. There will be a quad secretariat before you, uh, uh, before you know it. Um, but the quad, uh, Tony and I, uh, Admiral Tim uh, and Lawrence, have been having a conversation uh, amongst ourselves and with senior leadership colleagues uh, about where we as a leadership team want to put our energy uh, and the differences that we want to, uh, to make. Uh, and it boils down to uh, three watts uh, and three, uh, uh, three hows. I can only think in threes. Uh, uh, and I really just wanted to uh, share with you before we open up to questions uh, what those watts uh, and hows, uh, hows were. Uh, firstly, um, as, uh, uh, as Tony's already said, uh, first watt, simply to get on and deliver the integrated uh, review. Uh, I can't remember, uh, I think, a time uh, in defence where we've had quite such a clear uh, articulation uh, of what it is that the government wants from the department uh, and the armed forces, uh, and a pretty good sense of having the money uh, that you need to, uh, to deliver it. Uh, and I think uh, with that is not only an opportunity, but an obligation for us to make sure that we uh, deliver on that uh, investment, on that trust, uh, and get after uh, what it is that the government wants. Uh, now, there's been quite a lot of speculation uh, in light of recent events about whether the integrated review uh, still uh, stands. Uh, my personal sense is, uh, yeah, yes, it does. Uh, but as the Defence Secretary said uh, earlier this week, uh, it was a threat-based review. Uh, and of course, as uh, the threat changes, you need to uh, recalibrate uh, and review uh, plans. And that is a process that we will... Uh, certainly, uh, certainly look at, uh, but you have to be careful about uh, time frames, uh, about perspective. Uh, the lessons that you might have taken from Ukraine on day one or week one uh, are not necessarily where you are uh, a month in, five weeks in, uh, and we may draw different lessons in three months' time uh, and longer, so not something, I think, to, uh, to rush. Uh, but in any case, for me, the, the IR, the Integrated Review, framed our uh, sort of security context uh, through that lens of a return to uh, state-based competition. Uh, Russia was identified as the most acute threat to uh, European uh, and UK uh, security. Uh, even if our calibration of the uh, immediacy and brutality of that threat uh, was, were, was possibly off. Uh, we identified the importance of NATO uh, as the bedrock of our sort of collective security uh, and indeed the importance of multilateral uh, relationships such as our uh, framework uh, nation status with uh, Baltic, Scandinavian, and other European partners in the Joint Expeditionary Force. Uh, and that I in the IR, the integrated piece, uh, reflects the kind of whole of government uh, and internationalised uh, response uh, that Tony's touched on to, uh, uh, to current events. Uh, I also think that, you know, one year on, um, the IR's emphasis on uh, the importance to Britain's national interests uh, and international security uh, of the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, stands up uh, to scrutiny as well. Uh, it's no less an interesting or important area uh, and region for us uh, uh, just because of uh, events in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and we've seen over the past year the uh, successful carrier strike group deployment. Uh, we've got the uh, AUKUS arrangement. We've signed agreements with... Uh, Japan on technology uh, cooperation. Uh, and of course, uh, like many, we are keenly uh, interested and closely watching uh, China's reaction to uh, current events uh, and what this means for uh, both its relationship with Russia uh, and uh, its own, uh, own world view. Uh, second up, uh, the second of our three uh, watts uh, is about the support that we want to show to our nuclear program uh, in the MOD. Uh, through the IR, uh, that re-emergence of state-based uh, competition uh, underlines for me uh, the importance of the UK's uh, nuclear deterrence. Uh, and I think we have a clearer appreciation of our role as a nuclear uh, weapons state than perhaps we have had uh, for some time. Uh, now, over the next 10 years, the UK's nuclear enterprise, defence nuclear enterprise, is going through a major program of recapitalisation. Uh, the focus is on our, you know, the transfer, the transition, 
uh, from our Vanguard uh, class submarines to Dreadnought, uh, but we're investing heavily in infrastructure, in our warhead program as well. None of that is easy. Uh, uh, it's a, probably one of the most complex uh, uh, undertakings an industrial nation uh, can, uh, can do. And it's also, I think, broader than defence. Uh, increasingly, we need to see this as a national endeavour uh, that includes other government departments, uh, includes our industrial partners, of course, uh, and indeed important relationships with uh, international partners, particularly uh, the US. It's a national endeavour that we don't spend very much time talking about, quite often not very much time in defence, uh, and the four of us wants to uh, change that dynamic. Um, the third what really is about uh, just sustained improvement in uh, defence capability and defence output uh, uh, over the coming years. Now, lots of that is baked into uh, the integrated review uh, and the plans that we have uh, that support it. Um, uh, notwithstanding the, the book balancing point, which I, <laughs> uh, I absolutely get, um, the British taxpayer spends almost £50 billion uh, pounds a year uh, on defence, uh, and we owe them the maximum return uh, on that uh, investment. Uh, as an accounting officer, I am contractually obliged to uh, say that uh, one of my roles is to look out for the interests of the British taxpayer, uh, and that's really, really important. But for me, it's more than that, and it links back to the integrated review and the government's ask of the armed forces, and indeed potentially uh, to some early uh, lessons from Ukraine, uh, that uh, there's a real priority, I think, for us on how we can improve the deployability of the armed forces, how we can think about increasing the lethality uh, of our armed forces, uh, a focus on integration, uh, not just about how we are working with international partners, but how we are joining up uh, across all five uh, domains of uh, defence. I think there is a premium on uh, delivering new capability uh, on time. Getting equipment that you can field and use is going to be uh, really important. Uh, and a premium as well on assuring the availability uh, and sustainability of that equipment, being able to access and use the, uh, the equipment we've already got. Now, that's the three watts, and delivering on that is, uh, uh, is a pretty tall order. Uh, but we, we've focused on three, three hows that the four of us particularly want to uh, focus our energy on. First up um, is a clearer focus on our transformation program. Uh, Defence loves uh, a good uh, transformation program, uh, but it's not easy. And often, uh, I think we find that the uh, early ambition is not necessarily... Uh, seen through in, uh, in delivery. Uh, so we are particularly keen to focus on one really critical area uh, of transformation, and that's the Defence's uh, digital uh, programme. We need pace, uh, we need urgency uh, to ensure that all the component parts of our organisation uh, can properly join up, uh, talk to each other, integrate and be more effective. Uh, for me, though, it's not just about the technology, uh, important though that is, it's about skills and capability, uh, it's about standards, it's about mindset, and it's critically about data, how we corral it, how we collate it, and how we exploit it. Beyond that clear focus on transformation on digital, there's a really important theme for us about uh, acquisition reform. Uh, but for me, this is more about a programme of continuous improvement, uh, thinking, I mean, that doesn't in my line mean a lack of ambition, uh, but building on uh, review programs that we already uh, have in uh, place, but thinking again about skills, thinking about streamlining process, how do we get after new equipment that does what we need uh, more quickly in a more agile way. Uh, in my first year back in the department, I've had four public account committees, all of them have been about some form of acquisition, uh, whether that's equipment, infrastructure, uh, or the services that we in the armed forces need. Uh, the second how is about organising for uh, success. Uh, uh, senior civil servants, you've got to talk about structure uh, and uh, organisation and organisational design a bit. Um, and it's partly about that, but of course it comes back really uh, full circle to Tony's opening points about making sure that we are organised and fit for purpose against the uh, more dangerous world in which we find ourselves and against the demands uh, placed on us in the integrated review. Uh, that means creating a more focused head office uh, that is better able to provide strategic direction to the rest of defence and critically support delivery 
by the rest of defence uh, against what it is that we want to see. Uh, and I think getting that combination of uh, uh, direction and support uh, is something that we are uh, really keen to see uh, put into practice. Uh, and we are having a discussion about uh, how much smaller the word more focused means. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a live piece of, uh, piece of work. Uh, under our head office review, we're going to see a department that is on more of a campaign footing. Uh, we're going to see an enhanced role for uh, Chief of Joint Operations and the Chief of Defence uh, Intelligence in framing the range of military activity, uh, campaigning activity that we want to undertake uh, in the future. And we're also looking at changes about uh, how we draw together uh, at the strategic level uh, our industrial strategy, our relationships with uh, key suppliers, and providing a clearer focus on the departments and the armed forces' contribution to the government's wider domestic agenda, whether that's uh, economic recovery, levelling up, uh, the strength of the union, and so on. Uh, I said it's partly about structure, uh, because in the end, how we work together is as important, if not more important, than organisational design. Uh, and our third and probably most important how is about culture. Uh, how we leverage the enormous potential of our people, uh, whether they're in uniform, whether they're civil servants, or indeed uh, uh, contractors. Uh, it's something that CDS spoke about uh, in, uh, in December, uh, when he set out some of the frustration of working in a system where it is hard to get things done, uh, which is slow and often not as joined up uh, as we need to be. Uh, getting that right is about uh, increased trust and transparency. Uh, it is about injecting pace uh, and urgency. Uh, it's about being impatient with bureaucracy that gets in the way uh, and doesn't add value. Uh, and it is about shifting the focus from control uh, to uh, enablement. And we need to just be consistent uh, and demanding in our ambition in this space. Uh, it also encompasses our ongoing work on uh, diversity uh, and inclusion uh, and having a really compelling uh, learning and development offer uh, within the department to ensure we've got the skills that we need and the development opportunities for our people uh, for, uh, for the future. Um, I know I speak for Tony uh, and indeed the rest of the quad uh, and the wider uh, leadership team uh, when I say... Uh, how fortunate we are, uh, but also how proud we are uh, to lead such a dedicated and talented uh, group of people uh, in the department. Uh, in the end, uh, our ability to deliver on the integrated review, uh, our ability to react to uh, events in the world is down to the quality uh, of our people, and it is great to be in a leadership team that has that behind us. Problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both very much. You've anticipated lots of the questions I was going to ask you, even the heat you get in Parliament about buying stuff that's out of date. We might come back to that. But I wanted to start with the point that you have both um, uh, been given, given, in a sense, not an inch on, uh, which is that the integ integrated review, now just almost exactly a year ago, is not out of date. Your job is to implement it now. And you pointed, as many have, that it puts Russia right out there as a threat. Has nothing changed because of Ukraine? Do you want to go first? So, go first. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think we will have to look uh, and, and explore and understand what the events in Ukraine mean and uh, what impact does that have on the integrated review. And I think that's, that, that's perfectly fair. I think that would be, it would be insane not to, not to have the, the humility or the curiosity to look again at what we can learn from what's going on. But I think if you also step back, um, the integrated review was far more than just a security dimension. So I think the clarity of it being a traditional review alongside foreign policy and security, but it also included um, prosperity in the, 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 the economic agenda. It reflected that we're in a technological age. It also reflected other issues such as climate change and health security. So it was a, it was a compendium of big things, and that's where security was placed alongside. I think if you then look at some of the, the big uh, macro points, it rightly identified Russia as an acute threat. 
it reinforced that the way that we best protect our national security against that particular threat is through collective defence, and we're in the world's most powerful military alliance called NATO. And then it also reflected the importance of nuclear. And, and as David said, the sharpness that is maybe coming to the nuclear debate mm. at the moment. And, and therefore that, so those aspects I think are, remain very, very strong. And then, you, then I think you get to, 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 to more tactical points. And then I think we have to be cautious. We're, we're, we're five weeks into a, a war in Eastern Europe, and, and therefore we, we, we should be careful about, as David said, what the, 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 the lessons that were being offered up at week one might be reinforced now or they might be different at, at week five and so on. Um, and so I, yeah, it's, not, it's not that we, we're trying to resist or we're not willing to learn from that. It's just a, can we be cautious that some of the big things probably haven't changed and then look at some of the specifics as, 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 we, as we carry on with this crisis? Mm. Uh, I, I mean, I agree with that. Uh, um, and I think for me, it's about doubling down on what we said we wanted to do in an integrated review, getting on with that delivery, uh, and then really being sharp-eyed about where we need to uh, go further or, or think about things differently. Um, I don't know how it's going to end uh, in Ukraine, but uh, uh, even with uh, what you imagine will be uh, President Putin's disappointment in the performance of his uh, conventional forces, um, uh, the range of capabilities that he has at his disposal, uh, an unpredictable uh, and disappointed Putin feels to me uh, a dangerous one. Uh, and so that, that calibration of the threat, uh, I think, is something that we absolutely need to be alive to. Mm -hmm. And just on that perspective point, um, yes, you know, four weeks ago, uh, I was getting questions about uh, whether we need to uh, change our plans and invest in more armour. Uh, I'm now getting questions on why are we still investing in armour? Uh, and surely anti-tank weapons is the way to go. I mean, it's, look, it's neither of those. But... Right. It's, it's very fluid, and, and you're absolutely right, both of you, to point out how, just how much perspectives have changed in the, in the past five weeks. But if I, if I can just stay on this question of money and um, more people, more money, uh, uh, Tony, you said at one point, it's not about that, it's about, it's about delivering this. But isn't, uh, I can't be the only one who read the integrated review and thought Britain does not have the money to uh, uh, have the place in the world that it wants, that the, all the things described in the integrated review represent an enormous amount of spending if done properly. David, do you have enough money to do? Um, uh, well, the, genuinely, I think, um, and look, I take no credit for this because I came back after the, uh, the spending review uh, settlement and integrated review was agreed. Um, uh, it is about as good a defence settlement as I can remember uh, in the 30 years I, I joined, since I joined the department. Um, uh, I, I think actually I've got a more immediate challenge uh, in delivering the integrated review within the financial settlement we've got, uh, which is obviously that uh, the economic conditions, uh, inflation, both in terms of our direct costs and uh, how our industry partners, industry supply chain, uh, are experiencing inflation uh, is a, is a more, more pressing issue uh, about how we ensure that we deliver the plans that we uh, have currently got. Uh, uh, and that's an issue that we are absolutely grappling with uh, right now. Uh, beyond that, um, there's a question about whether there are uh, things in the integrated review plans that we want to do faster. Uh, what does that mean for the profile of our spend or whether there's anything uh, additional? Now, in the end, that will be a uh, decision for uh, ministers to calibrate uh, where, where they put their discretionary, uh, discretionary taxpayer pound. Um, uh, and, you know, you can uh, certainly make an argument for... Uh, increased investment in defence and security, uh, as indeed you can see uh, international partners uh, committing to uh, more investment uh, already. Uh, but my immediate focus with the team is on uh, delivering our current plans and dealing with some of the, uh, the shorter term pressures that we have. Can I, can I just add to that, Norman? Uh, because I also, to David's point about this is, the clarity of the integrated review and the fact it was backed up by additional money 
And I think the, if you go back, that was, um, that was an extraordinary commitment by government in the middle of a pandemic or coming to the end of a pandemic and the economic uncertainty that existed there to push an extra 24 billion to match the integrated review. And the, the, when, I, when I say about, um, it's not about more people and more money, it's just, it's trying to combat what I think sometimes is a tendency, which is if we had a bit more money, everything would be fine. Well, actually we're a department that gets nearly 50 billion pounds and best we spend that money as wisely and as effectively as possible and deliver against the government's objectives in that way. And then let's have a separate conversation about whether or not things have changed and the threats change and we need even more resource to do an even better job. But I'm very cautious of these constant conversations of if we somehow had a little bit more of this or that or whatever, everything would be fine and we ignore the hole that we've already got. Well, thank you for that. That's whole with a W, <laughs> just for clarity. I got that. Thank you for the extra, extra clarity. Um, David, it is part of your job to turn up in front of Parliament. And um, yeah. Margaret Hodge, when, when uh, head of the Public um, uh, Accounts Committee, um, devoted a vast amount of time simply to the MOD, and then like a whole chapter to the book she then wrote. And it remains a theme of what the, the, the POC does, of saying, um, could the MOD not have bought this stuff better and, and so on. What, what, is, what is the kind of answer you feel you can give? Because it, it really does occupy quite a bit of, of parliamentary time, uh, simply the MOD's procurement. Yeah, I mean, it does, and, uh, and rightly so, whether that's uh, looking at our equipment programme or our infrastructure and estates programme uh, or, or more broadly. Um, firstly, I think we aren't good enough at getting out um, uh, what it is that we actually do uh, do well. Uh, and we deliver the vast majority uh, of our uh, equipment contracts uh, on cost uh, and uh, on time. Uh, the Defence Equipment Support Organisation uh, delivers year-on-year -year efficiency in its activity. Uh, it's let something like 4,500 contracts uh, in the last five, uh, six years. The challenge is in those relatively small number of uh, high profile, but also you know, really important, complex technological development programs, which are uh, at the heart of the capabilities that our, our services uh, need. Uh, and it is you know, genuinely uh, a difficult undertaking, both in terms of uh, government activity uh, and the ask that we place on, uh, on industry. Uh, and it's something that actually our international partners find uh, equally, uh, equally difficult. So uh, I think the nature of the ask is, uh, is very hard. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't need to get uh, better uh, at it. Um, my point about continuous improvement is that uh, in this area, I'm not particularly a fan of uh, wholesale review or a fundamental review uh, of acquisition. Uh, we've done about 13 of those in the last 30 years. Uh, what we need is some space to get on and get the basics right. It's about improving our skills, whether that's uh, commercial skills, project management skills, you know, program delivery skills. It's about improving our cost forecasting. It's about improving the way uh, we uh, let and manage our uh, contracts. So uh, having some space to do that rather than throwing it all up in the air uh, and coming back with a new organisational mm. design, but in the meantime, we're not buying stuff in the way that we need to. Mm. Uh, I think there's also, just back to my, my previous remark, um, we are adjusting to a world in which there is higher inflation than many of us have been used to for some time. That really, really puts a premium on uh, timely delivery. Time is now literally money. Uh, so uh, thinking about how we streamline our processes, whether that's in approvals, how we think about bringing in equipment uh, early and then you know, developing it uh, through uh, life. What you don't want is something that takes longer than you think it's going to take. Uh, and that is quite a change in mm. our outlook. Mm. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm going to go to questions now. There are lots. Uh, there'll be, I think, a lot in the room and lots online. Thank you for sending them in. There's a big geo political block and quite a lot about procurement and things. Um, let's go to start in the room. Here. Um, Sam Coates from Sky. Um, so Tony, uh, 
if eventually we get some kind of peace settlement in Ukraine, um, it's presumably going to have to involve some kind of security guarantee. Um, can you give us any sense of what that might look like? Is it kind of NATO light, or is there a different model? Is there anything that you can tell us about where we might end up since we're talking about the future and British commitment or troops or, or money? Um, and David, you mentioned China. Um, if China did to Taiwan what Russia's doing to Ukraine, do you think we have seen the kind of blueprint that the West might use to challenge China? Or do you think that perhaps there would be some kind of different model to try and deter and discourage China from doing that? So I think it's very hard to, to answer your question with specifics. Um, because particularly at this point in time, um, particularly given the range of potential outcomes and what those precise security uh, structures might be. But I think what we can say is that the UK support and the commitment to Ukraine is enduring. And I think the fact that the UK was the first to recognise Ukraine's independence in 1991. Then you had Operation Orbital in 2015, where that closeness with UK armed forces and especially our land and maritime forces with Ukraine and how pivotal that has been in terms of our continued support now, and then rightly that that support continues into the future. So I anticipate that the UK will feature strongly in terms of continuing our support to Ukraine and especially the military to support to Ukraine, and we'll have to wait and see as to what is the precise security architecture that that, that fits into. Thank you. Let's go here in the front. Oh, sorry, go, sorry, you go to answer. I thought you'd waved away. Sorry, so please think, go ahead. Uh, no, I think it's Tony set out. I mean, for me, the, the key features are the, the response to Ukraine has been, one, uh, a very high degree of international unity uh, and resolve. Uh, and I think that is going to be something for China to think about. Uh, I think it's uh, about the, the full range of uh, instruments of response, including uh, sanctions, economic measures, uh, and whilst my guess is, you know, Putin will have priced some of that in, uh, I would be surprised if he's priced in everything that has been uh, done. Uh, and I think that would uh, be something that the Chinese will be uh, reflecting on. And then there's the range of what practical uh, uh, military assistance you can give, not only live in the event, but back to our training activity with Ukraine uh, since 2015, actually in, in advance. Uh, and in anything particularly around Taiwan, clearly where the US positioning uh, is on that is going to be uh, absolutely key. Thank you. Thank you. Larissa Brown from The Times. CDS, can you um, tell us how worried you are um, about sort of Putin's next moves? Do you think he'll still try and take Kiev? And also, to what extent do you think there is a mutiny in his armed forces? And is that among the senior ranks or is that sort of the lower ranking soldiers? And uh, David, in the integrated review, uh, you obviously committed to increasing the number of warheads. And I'm just wondering, do you think that that goes far enough or do you think that you need to sort of look again at whether the UK needs an increase in warheads? Thank you. So the, the first point I would say is we are, we are incredibly cautious about pronouncements made by Russia. So if you go, if you go back uh, five weeks or a bit, a bit longer, Russia was very, very clear that it had no plans to invade Ukraine. Um, so I think when Russia makes these pronouncements, the, the, the need to analyze carefully what is actually happening is important. When it comes to Kyiv, I think we're seeing that Russia's ambitions to take Kyiv and Russia's ambitions to take the whole of Ukraine and, and do that in a very swift and impressive fashion, uh, those ambitions have fallen apart. Whether that, and it looks now that um, less emphasis is being placed on Kyiv and more emphasis is being placed in the east and the south, we're starting to see the early indications of those forces being moved back from Kyiv and uh, retreating to both Russia and Belarus. That in itself is a difficult evolution for Russia because they are doing that under contact. So Ukraine armed forces will attack uh, 
those Russian forces as they retreat. And then, and then I think that we, we have to wait and see to see how that materialises and how that shapes in the future. And I'm trying to think that your second, your, your, your second point was... And yeah, so, so I... Um, maybe it's a naval officer in me that sort of twitches uh, when people say mutiny. I, I, um, mutiny is a strong word. So I think that, I think we are unsurprisingly um, seeing disquiet at all levels uh, within Russians armed forces, but what, how substantial that is, um, still, we, we, we still have to wait and see. So you've seen it at the most junior level, which is shocking in a professional sense that Russian officers might take people into combat and those people don't even know that they're going into combat, which seems a, an insane thing to do professionally. And it's a morally bankrupt thing to do for any individual. And then as you car carry on up through the system, we're also seeing the pressure that exists with whether it's their tactical and operational level commanders and that their plans haven't gone well and then you get up to their most senior commanders who are clearly under pressure because Russia has made this catastrophic mistake and then the way that it's prosecuted the invasion has uh, been, it looks to us that it's been uh, very poorly conducted and therefore there is pressure on, on, on Russia's military. But that, that how substantial that is and whether or not that, involve, that evolves into something more impactful, we're going to have to wait and see. Thank you. And David, there was a question to you. Uh, yes, so just on uh, warheads, um, I don't think we'll have any immediate plans uh, to review that increased um, stockpile. Uh, the judgment that we took was around what, what you need in order to maintain a minimum credible UK uh, deterrent, and that was mainly a set of capability-based uh, judgments, which have not particularly changed over the last uh, uh, five weeks. But I think the fact that we were willing to increase uh, in the last uh, IR shows a determination to main that, maintain that credible, uh, uh, credible deterrent. So uh, you know, it's something we will keep uh, keep under review. Thank you. There's one here, and then I'm coming to uh, two here, and then I'm going to come to online questions. Thank you. Hi, it's Dan Saver from The Guardian. Um, a question for you, CDS. Uh, uh, do you, you know, President Zelensky has obviously been making these appeals for more powerful weaponry of various kinds uh, to help him perhaps push the Russians back. Do you think there is a case for giving, giving him some of those things? I'm, I'm not talking about fighter jets, which seems to be ruled out, but there are perhaps other areas where... Can the, can the definition of defensive be stretched a bit more? Is that something you would advise to the Prime, Prime Minister, perhaps? And David, what have we learned a bit about um, uh, the sort of industrial, how the industrial base can cope with the demands of Ukraine? For example, yeah. I don't know if you can say anything about end law production, whether that's now, whether the MOD has sort of asked for a backfill and whether the pace of end law production can keep up with Ukrainian use. But if you can't say too much about that, just a bit more broadly, what might we have learned? You know, have we got all these fancy modern weapons that we can't make quick enough uh, uh, and therefore we have to go to more basic stuff in a, in a war situation? So I think um, the, 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 the simple answer, Dan, is, it, is it's constantly under review. So the UK was the first European power um, to provide lethal aid. And then you saw, as part of this extraordinary and impressive uh, reaction by the world, whether it was in the economic sanctions or in the social, political, cultural space, the world's reaction. But that was also refre reflected with other countries providing lethal aid. And some of them, countries that in the past didn't have a strong tr tradition of providing lethal aid, such as, such as Belgium. And I think um, what is significant is that the UK, it was uh, the Defence Secretary a couple of weeks ago that held an international donors conference that looked at both lethal and non-lethal aid. The second of those conferences is going on today with over 20 nations, again, looking at the problem to say, um, is, is, it, is it more boots? Is it more ration packs? Is it additional fuel? Is it ammunition? Is it defensive weapons? Well, what ex how far do you extend that phrase defensive weapons and what actually 
would have an impact in Ukraine, what can the Ukraine armed forces absorb? Because they're, they're, yeah, we've got to remember that they're in the middle of a war. And, then, and, and, and I think that's where we've got to be sensible because there are some things that you might want to provide over the next 30 or 60 days because they can be instantly used. And then when people talk about some of the more sophisticated capabilities, there's some, they, sometimes people skip over the fact that you might need to have quite a long training programme and actually might then need quite uh, complicated support arrangements. And so the whole, the, the whole thing is under review. And the piece I would, I would, I would emphasise is just a couple of weeks ago was the first international donors conference. The second one today, both have had over 20 nations. Uh, and, and, and it's the success of those. And then how we keep these flows going. And look, on the supply chain, I mean, as you'd expect in terms of the uh, uh, immediate activity, yeah, I mean, yes, we're engaging closely with uh, key suppliers about their ability to ramp up production of uh, particular munitions and other equipment, both to uh, allow us to continue supply into Ukraine, but also to uh, help us and other uh, partners uh, replenish stocks where we have been uh, passing on uh, existing uh, equipment. But, but I think the, in some ways the more interesting sort of question behind it is, is really one around national resilience. Um, uh, and I think there are questions for us. Uh, it goes to my, uh, my third what, uh, actually about how we are sizing stockpiles uh, for some of our uh, key weapons and munitions. And I think that's probably an area where we will want to uh, invest more uh, in future. Uh, I think it also goes to just the way in which we uh, routinely buy uh, some of these uh, uh, weapons where you have a, uh, a sort of a boom uh, and then we sort of sit on the stockpile and not much happens. Thinking about how you build resilience into the supply chain uh, to allow a steady supply of weapons that then you can surge from, uh, I think is something for us to think through. Uh, as it happens is something, you know, in my experience in the Department of Health, uh, thinking about ventilators, PPE, um, uh, and so on. Uh, what is the UK manufacturing capability and capacity uh, that we want for crisis, uh, as well as for uh, a peacetime when we are all focused on productivity and keeping costs down? Great, thank you. We're going to take one, one more here, and then I'm going to go to a bunch online. Uh, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence, could you? Um, naval operations, uh, last summer, we engaged in quite a significant operation with HMS Defender. Uh, the Russians are blockading uh, Ukrainian ports. Uh, do you see any role for the Royal Navy at the moment or in the weeks to come uh, in the Black Sea area again? And for either of you, we signed a, a three-way security arrangement with Ukraine and Poland just before the start of the war. Has that been activated, um, or was it something that, in a sense, was overtaken by events? So, thank you, Lawrence. I mean, on the, I didn't see any immediate Royal Navy operations in the Black Sea. I think if that was to happen, it would be with NATO, and then I think that that then gets into the debate about does this look like escalation and uh, and so on. I think the, the significant part is the fact that HMS Defender was in the Black Sea and as part of that closeness with the Ukraine Armed Forces and the Ukrainian Navy, I think it was the, it was the, um, the arrangement that was announced with Ukraine in terms of uh, an export credit guarantee and additional ships being bought by Ukraine as well as missile systems and so on. So all of that um, is, 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 is still there to, 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 to to be delivered in the future. And then if you look at naval operations at the moment, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on. So it's the, it's the danger of looking at Ukraine and seeing it purely as the geography of Ukraine and uh, the struggle going on between Russia and Ukraine. I think what, we're, what we would say that we're seeing is something that affects the whole of the Euro-Atlantic. And actually, if you, um, if you follow what I was saying, it's also much broader than that because it's a challenge to the world order and, and, and the international system. So that's where you then see how NATO has responded, increasing its readiness, strengthening its posture, 
and that goes all the way through to the North Atlantic, to the Barents, to the Baltic, to that eastern flank, to the fact that we have several carrier groups uh, in the eastern Mediterranean at the moment. Those have got Royal Navy ships with them. We're, um, we're just concluding an exercise in Norway, which has 35,000 uh, NATO troops with it. It's got HMS Prince of Wales uh, as, the, as the maritime flagship for NATO. So all of the UK Armed Forces are involved in a wider sense of the Euro-Atlantic security. And then there are some specifics in terms of which might be more prominent as being directly connected with Ukraine. But I would just observe that Ukraine is far more than the geography of Ukraine. It's Euro-Atlantic and much, and, and much more broader than that. I'd like to come to a, so just a, a set of questions on deterrence, which could be summarized as has deterrence failed. But let me take a pair of them in particular from Mary Dejewski of The Independent. Given, Russians, sorry, given Russia's invasion of Ukraine, does the UK's policy of deterrence in relation to Russia, which she says was followed to the letter in the run-up to 24th of February, have to go back to the drawing board? And one from Patricia... Lewis, who says, and this is on nuclear deterrence, I can see how Russian nuclear weapons have terrified NATO, but how have UK weapons deterred Russia? Isn't the problem with nuclear that the West has values such as minimizing civilian casualties, so we don't use chemical weapons, biological weapons, and indeed um, nuclear, uh, or that we would hold back from, from, from doing stuff, the old problem about the use of these, these weapons. So these two aspects of this, which of you wants to start? Do you want to start on the first one, and I'll do the second, or...? Do you want, yeah. Yes, OK. I, I'll, <laughs> or do you want... So on deter... I... I um, so I'm wary of... So deterrence failed in terms of the deterrence of Russia going into Ukraine. But the deterrence model, again, is much broader than, than, than merely Russia and Ukraine. And, and so on our... Our messaging, um, the, what the world was saying, uh, what, what was being projected to Russia ahead of the invasion was uh, incredibly clear. Um, it talked about the economic impact. It talked about the political, diplomatic, the fact that uh, Russia would become par a pariah state. Uh, and there was a... Clearly, Russia miscalculated because I think Russia, in its mind, thought that the, the world response would be closer to the one that it experienced in 2014 with Crimea. Now, that you can view that um, as, a, as a failure of, of deterrence. But if you look in a more broader sense of uh, what are we trying to... We're trying to de deter Russia behaviour more generally... So on the, on the positive side of the ledger, um, combating Russia as a threat across the whole of the Euro-Atlantic, um, maintaining the freedom of manoeuvre for our nuclear deterrent in the North Atlantic, maintaining the integrity of NATO states and their sovereignty and their independence. And that's, that, that, that is the formal position and that's the one where our effort has been uh, more focused upon. That, that has been successful even against what we have identified as a Russian threat which has been getting gradually worse over the last 20 years or so. So I, again, I'm, I, I, I'm just cautious of this zooming in to a Russia-Ukraine border and then magnifying that somehow this big thing called deterrence has failed, whereas this enormous thing called deterrence um, is much bigger than merely, um, I don't mean this in a, in, in a disrespectful way, it's much bigger than the specific of, of, of Russia and Ukraine. Mm. So I, I, it, I, I know that's a, this is probably a um, frustrating answer for some, mm. but I think that, that that's the dilemma that we're in. And that NATO, as our primary security mechanism, did not extend as a security guarantee to, to Ukraine. And, and therefore, I think the, 
the so what of that is the importance of collective defence and how powerful collective defence is. And then I think you get to, as a sort of uh, handing the baton over, how important um, the nuclear dimension is and how we have been a responsible nuclear power and helped to, in our lifetimes, temper what I think for many of us growing up we anticipated to be uh, extraordinary nuclear proliferation, which I think responsible nuclear powers have, have managed that uh, potential problem. And nuclear has also managed to create this security stability mm. in terms of avoiding even worse and bigger conflicts than the one that we're seeing at the moment. David, you, have, you, you now have the, the so yeah. old moral problem of um, <laughs> what is the value of these terrible weapons if we're less likely to use them than our enemies? Well, I mean, so, so firstly, I think just echoing, uh, I mean, Tony's point, that there is a question about what it is that you are looking to um, deter. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think at the moment, the combination of the collective security guarantees through NATO uh, with a nuclear umbrella, uh, we are not seeing direct attacks by Russia on, on NATO partners on uh, NATO territory. So... Uh, you know, the fundamental purpose um, is, uh, you know, is there. Uh, the nuclear rhetoric from Russia, I mean, is clearly uh, uh, worrying. Um, but uh, at the moment, I mean, it is uh, rhetoric. It isn't particularly, I think, deterring uh, uh, the West either, you know, individually or uh, multilaterally from uh, doing uh, doing things that we want to do, whether that's our strengthening of uh, the NATO eastern flank, uh, support to uh, Ukraine. And if you think about the response, which possibly has most direct impact on uh, Putin and his immediate circle of supporters, uh, namely the package of economic sanctions, I mean, they have not been dialed down uh, as a result of um, uh, nuclear rhetoric from, uh, from him. So... Um, uh, whether it's uh, an attempt at escalation or, or nuclear blackmail, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's currently working. Uh, but if I just pivot back to the integrated review, um, as we think about the ways in which our armed forces um, are going to be used in the in the future, uh, and it goes back right back to that opening point about the relationship between the military uh, and the civil service. Um, the integrated review for me is as much about the Department of State function, about defence policy, about alliances and partnerships, about how you escalate uh, and de-escalate, about deterrence, about a whole set of policy and political uh, judgments and how we support ministers to, uh, uh, to make those. So a real area of focus. Um, but at the moment, I don't think that uh, uh, Putin's nuclear posturing is delivering uh, any practical effect. OK, well, thank you for that. Um, we have a world of questions here, and almost literally, um, China, Europe. Let me just pick up some of the, the China, the Indo-Pacific ones, because we haven't touched so much on that. And there's a whole stream of questions about why the integrated review had a tilt in that direction. Um, one from Philip Mead saying, uh, particularly to David, is the Indo-Pacific really an equal priority with European security? Uh, and others asking, in essence, whether... Uh, this is America's problem, security problem to solve. Well, so in terms of threat, um, I don't think the integrated review said, said they, they were uh, equal. You know, we identified Russia as the most acute threat to uh, our security. Um, but if we think about either threats to international security uh, and the world order, or indeed if you turn that threat lens round to uh, 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 opportunity, uh, whether that's about our status, uh, thinking about global trade, uh, international partnerships. Uh, actually, I think there are lots of UK interests in uh, the Indo-Pacific region. I mean, our relationship with Australia and New Zealand, uh, our relationship with Japan, our relationship with uh, India, uh, lots of positives uh, there for us to pursue. Now, those have to be calibrated, uh, obviously, uh, and how much emphasis you choose to put where uh, is, uh, you know, well, it is a matter of choice, um, we talk about a, uh, a tilt rather than the more fundamental uh, shift uh, that the American, uh, uh, our American partners have been uh, talking about. Uh, so I think it's not 50-50, uh, um, uh, but it's not 100-0 uh, 
uh, either. But I don't know, Tony, you may just want to offer a yeah, quick I, perspective. No, I, no, I completely agree. So I, um, it was this slightly strange word, tilt. So I think, I think it was an honest uh, piece. Our fundamental security architecture remains anchored in the Euro-Atlantic. But as I said, that, that this was a review that was um, set against economic and foreign policy and science and climate change and so on. Um, I, I, with uh, the head of the Air Force, accompanied uh, Ben Wallace as, as, as Secretary of State, where he went out. We went out to the Indo-Pacific ahead of the carriers, ahead of the carrier going uh, going in, into the South China Sea and so on. And it was a reminder that we are a P5 nation, and with that go much broader responsibilities than simply the Euro-Atlantic. We're the fifth largest economy in the world. We, we, we have nations that want us to be involved and want us, whether that's in an economic sense or in a leadership sense or in a security sense. Um, and then when you look at it, when it comes down to resources, it's, um, yeah, we're shaped for the uh, Euro-Atlantic, and then we already have some responsibilities um, in the Indo-Pacific, the Five Powers Defence Agreement. Um, we've got our um, relationship with um, Brunei. We've got some um, longer-term relationships that we've, already, that, we've, that we've always had. We've now got AUKUS. We've just had a, a very successful carrier deployment last year. The Army have announced a stronger relationship with Japan. Um, the, 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 these, are, these are things that we can do from within our existing resources and on, on our inventory. And then also it comes back to if 40%, at least 40% of the world's GDP by 2030 is going to be centered around the Indo-Pacific, then an outward facing um, large economy like the UK has got national interests that extend beyond the Euro-Atlantic. So I think it's, it's exactly as, as, as was articulated, and it's one that is not a massive draw on defence. At the moment, it's, um, it's two uh, OPVs, offshore patrol vessels, um, that are out there, and then we'll add to that over time. Um, and, and again, there'll, there'll be periodic points where we will where we will exercise more strongly in the Indo-Pacific, but it's, it, it, it's not something that is, um, that, is, that is leading to an imbalance elsewhere. Mm. We're going to have to draw it to a close there. Um, there are some fascinating questions here, and I wish we could get into all that about, uh, indeed, our procurement, about, about um, ships, about the nature of a security guarantee that the UK might uh, offer to Ukraine, if that is part of the the solution, um, all kinds of things. I'm simply going to throw in one last one. You're allowed to give a one-word answer. Does the tank have a future? Someone has asked. It's prompted, obviously, by all these pictures we're seeing. A one-word on answer, yes. Fine. David? Yes. Fine. Okay. There we have it. Um, thank you all for terrific questions uh, in the room and online. Um, I wish we had um, much, much more time, but we don't. And thank you both for coming here today and coming together. Thank you. <laughs>